Hi, welcome to the show. Thanks for being with us today. Here on 700 Club Interactive, we like to answer questions and topics sent in from viewers like you. That's right. And our friend um, Henry on Facebook has asked us, Hi, John. Cha I'm sorry. In John chapter 1, it said that John came as a witness to the light. How can I bear witness to the light in my own life? which is a great question. And I think before we answer that question, we need to just briefly read the scripture that um, this Henry is, is referring to. So this is coming from John 1, verses 6 through 8. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. He came as a witness to testify concerning that light so that through him all might believe. He himself was not the light. He came only as a witness to the light. And obviously the light is Jesus. So the verses before that, John is saying that Jesus is the light of the world. Yeah, he's saying, you know, John the Baptist, no, I'm not the promised one. Yes. I'm not fit to untie his sandals. Yeah. I baptize you with water, but he will mm -hmm. baptize you with his spirit. And so he's pointing to Jesus. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. So I think, Henry, to answer your question, you're wondering how you can be a witness. Just keep living your life for the Lord. You know, um, I think it's, 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 John was a lamp. He was a vessel, right? So if you, if you think of a light, if you think of a lamp, there's light inside of the lamp. So Jesus, if you're a, a born again believer, Jesus is inside of you. You're just a vessel shining Christ's light. It's not ours. It's his that is inside of us. Yeah, and the key word witness, you know, yeah. John the Baptist was a witness to the light. We're called to be witnesses. What does a witness do? I, I remember my grandfather who preached around the world. He told me, Andy, a witness tells what happened. That's good, yeah. A witness tells what happened. Mm -hmm. So if our life has been transformed by Christ, that's yeah. a great place to start. Tell people what has happened in our life. Mm -hmm. Some other things, you know, in Acts 4, um, Peter and John were uh, speaking about Christ and doing amazing miracles. And people said, these men have been with Jesus. So. Mm. Yeah. This is a tough call. This is a lot to live up to. But when, when people see us, hear us, or interact with us, do they say, this person's been with Christ. They've spent yeah. time at his feet. You know, what's our demeanor like to other people? Yeah, and I think sometimes as Christians, we can get caught up on, okay, how do I witness to this person? How do I witness to this person? And it's, you know, I think take the pressure off, right? You know, a lot of times our actions speak louder than our words. So live your life according to the word. That's what people, they watch more than they listen. Exactly. Mm -hmm. You know, um, you know, studies have shown that actually uh, one of the least ineffective ways to communicate to someone is, is somebody standing before a crowd with a mic. Because most of the time we forget what they say. But if someone's watching the way we live our lives, that, that speaks volumes. So live your life with Jesus. Live out loud in a, in a sense. And of course, don't cause others to stumble. Yeah. Right. I mean, we're, we're told that in scripture. Do not cause others to stumble by the way you're living. Um, and of course, love. Jesus in scripture points to love as the main way we express what Christ has done for us. And of course, Jesus, you know, tells parables like about the Good Samaritan and in yeah. the example set. And scripture tells us to be strong and stand, stand, stand. And when we're standing, we can help others. Yeah. That's maybe the toughest, one of the toughest calls about living a, a Christ-filled life is helping others, showing them love, going out of our way. You know, the four men carried the paralytic to Jesus. Yeah. It doesn't say how far they carried him, how long it took them, but it's that going out of our way to show love to others. It is a yeah. great way to be a witness. Absolutely. And, you know, we can't do this without help from the Holy Spirit. You know, we can't do it For in sure. our own flesh. We can't do it in our own might. But by your power, says the Lord, like only through the Holy Spirit are we able to do that. And this that. question itself has made me consider, you know, am I being a light? How, how am I witnessing for Christ in my home, in my workplace, in my friend relationships here in this program? I mean, we're supposed to meditate on our walk and how we're doing. Yeah. And this is a good question for yeah, that. Absolutely. All right, guys. Well, if you would like to ask us a question or give us a topic to talk about on the show, like we just did, make sure you visit our social media pages. Look for our different posts on the different platforms, such as Facebook and Instagram at 700 Club Interactive. And make sure to visit our YouTube page for extended interviews and stories. Andrew? Super Bowl quarterback, ESPN analyst. Trent Dilfer reached the upper echelon in the world of professional sports. So what's Trent doing now? And why does he say football is just a subplot to the bigger thing going on in his life? Tom Buring brings us the answers. God takes what we view as tragedy and turns it into triumph. And I'm now wise enough to see that happen. Trent Dilfer is still the impassioned quarterback 
first fueled by a 14-year NFL career, then as a primetime football analyst. Now he roams sidelines and weight rooms as Lipscomb Academy's head coach, shaping young sons from the crucible of his own journey. And the football's cool, and we don't sacrifice it ever, but it is a subplot to the bigger thing that's going on. And guess what that's going to be? Great husbands, compassionate people, and empathetic people, and people that handle social justice issues the right way. We want to fill that gap out of a small Christian school in Nashville. Is there a quarterback in all of us? A lot of people like the flash and sizzle of the quarterback. Very few want the burden that comes with it. Your job is to make everybody around you better. And you can't make them better unless you're bringing them together. And you can't bring them together if it's about you. Halfway into your 14 NFL seasons, yeah. you win the Super Bowl with the Ravens. Ultimately, was that enough to satisfy your NFL ambition? No, I, I'm very honest that I'm very, very disappointed in my career. I underachieved. I was a terrible teammate early. Didn't attack the development part like I should have. Our defense obviously is arguably the greatest of all time. We played with great togetherness. It makes the disappointment of my personal performance worthwhile because I was part of something truly great. 2003, you're approaching your 10th season. Your five-year-old son, Trevin, surprisingly grows sick. Yeah. It changed your life. Mm -hmm. He gets a virus that attacks his heart, one in a million. Uh, it kills his heart in a matter of days. He gets resuscitated four times, miraculously gets put on life support when they said it can never happen. He stays on that life support system for 40 days. He gets a systemic infection. We understand that this is out of our control. To have to turn off life support and to watch end of life of your son, that's the hard part is thinking, putting myself in his shoes as he went through this. Rock bottom. Rock bottom is probably the best way to explain it. Anger is my default for pain. The scar tissue that builds up gets thicker. Self-awareness of what the pain's done to you. Fear sets in at that point because now you're afraid what it's gonna do to your kids, your spouse, your loved ones. Numbing sorrow of life not being the same. This is the beauty of this story. We took our kids to a breakfast place on Monday nights. We called it a crazy dinner. And as we're walking out that night, my five-year-old son pulls on my jeans and says, Dad, I want to know Jesus. I said, that's awesome. He goes, I, think it, I want to know Jesus right now. This is the Holy Spirit working through a five-year-old saying, I'm calling you to me this moment. And we kneel at a pancake house while people are walking in. As the girls walk behind us, and Trevin, at five years old, authentically prayed to receive Jesus. So let's fast forward six months later when we're turning off life support, but we know where he's going. Now we can thank God that he's with him instead of with us. You played five more seasons. You jump in with ESPN for a decade, then coaching up prospects. The end of my career in ESPN hardened me. Definitely some good things that came out of that, but it hardened me as a man. My kids started seeing it. I lost some gentleness. I lost some compassion. I had gotten complacent. I was chasing the world. I was edgier. But you started being confronted about significance. Yeah. What challenged you? I did not feel like I was having impact. Okay, Lord, I'm listening. Obviously, you're doing something. He just made it really clear that I had said no to serve him to do hard things, to be uncomfortable, to have impact, to show grace and mercy that's been shown to me. And I hadn't been doing it, I'd been serving myself. In 2019, a high school coaching search brought Lipscomb Academy to Trent for recommendations. Instead of taking his advice, they offered him the job. He surprisingly took it, a rebuild for the program and a renewal for Trent. I'm going to coach a high school football team that has 38 kids on it that won three games in two years. and. That's where he took me. Turning agony around, are you seeing this transformation playing out before your eyes? I am, and I think that comes from all this pain that's now being repurposed in this passion to see every individual in my care chase their best and to understand that their best is the same power that rose Christ from the dead, lives in us and gives life to our mortal bodies. The power of raising Christ from the dead lives in us, and that's the passion, and I'm fired up. Do you see Trevin oh, yeah, in every, the every eyes kid. of those high school kids? And I tear up every once in a while when I, if I tear it down. Okay, Trent. 
You're giving them the mechanics of a coach, but the heart of a dad. I'm simply pouring my life into your kid. Let him be the fullness of who he is. His God-given potential and all that goes with that. Where do you find your Savior in the face of suffering? Mm. There's a lot of pain, and that's where I'm seeing Jesus surface the most, because that's where he meets people the most intimately. You are broken, you are confused, you are angry, you are hurting. Guess where Jesus is? He's right there. He's like, I got you. The redemptive quality of Christ has taken really bad stuff and turned it into good stuff. That's where I'm seeing Jesus show up the most as a coach. The players on that football team, I think you'll agree, are very fortunate and blessed to have Trent Dilfer as their head coach. Trent just shared so much wisdom, wisdom with us, didn't he? Even towards the end, how he said the pain is still there. The pain is real and raw. What Trent and his family went through was so difficult, so heartbreaking to lose their son, and their son was so young. And here we are years later, and Trent says, yes, it's still tough. It's still painful. But he has seen, you know, the Holy Spirit is described as the comforter in Scripture, that the Holy Spirit is the comforter. And Trent is still experiencing that. A lot of times we think with grief, we have, to, we have to get over this now and move forward. And yes, we don't want to stay in a season of misery and sadness and heartbreak too long. We need to let the Holy Spirit work on us and bring us out of that season. But it doesn't mean the pain will go away. So if you're a Christian, if you live for Christ and you still have heartache and pain and sorrow over something tragic and traumatic like the death of a child, I think that's a normal thing to experience and, and still go through. But can we bring it to the cross? Here's Trent, who has picked up the pieces in many ways, and he says, okay, now I'm going to invest in another generation. I'm going to invest in other people who need hope and inspiration and encouragement. And even in his grief, and even after this traumatic event, the Holy Spirit, the Lord God, is not done with Trent. He's still showing him areas that Trent needs to spiritually grow, according to what he told us. He said he became hardened, and that's natural, isn't it? That after the death of a child, your spirit may grow hardened and tough. And the Holy Spirit is never done trying to make us more like Christ. So this has been a journey for Trent. I so appreciate his honesty and walking us through that experience his family had. I remember Trent Dilfer as a quarterback, a Super Bowl quarterback, and he had the media all around him. And with that Ravens team, he was not ashamed to speak on behalf of his faith in Christ. And that was during the highlight of his career. And here he is now, a couple decades later, and he's sharing in a different way about what Christ has done for him, how Jesus has healed his heart and continues to do so. If you would like prayer for anything you've been experiencing, we would love to pray for you here at CBN. You can call 800-700-7000. Share your prayer need. Maybe some of you are going through grief yourself. You've had a traumatic thing happen in your family, and you just need someone to go to the throne on behalf of you. You may not even have the words to articulate to the Lord. We're happy to pray for you. Give us a call, 800-700-7000. Ashley? Her life flashing before her eyes and getting a glimpse of her own funeral. Terminal cancer stalked Abigail every waking moment. You will die from this. That's what her doctor said. So why is Abigail still alive to tell her story and completely cancer free? Take a look. I had those moments waking up just in a cold sweat, knowing that the Grim Reaper was standing at the foot of my bed. Like, I have a right to be here. I took your dad out, took a grandparent. I never even knew my grandparents. I have a right. I'm here to get you too. All her life, Abigail Holt Jennings had braced herself for this moment, a battle with cancer. She'd watched her dad fight it for 10 years until he passed away when she was 16. Now 42 years old, she'd been diagnosed with an aggressive form of metastatic cancer. I think the Lord was preparing me, like, you're about to enter a battle, but I am with you. Less than a year earlier, she'd undergone a double mastectomy after learning she had stage three breast cancer. She thought she was in the clear, but six months later at a follow-up PET scan with her oncologist. He said, this is what I feared. It's moving to your lungs and you see these places? He's like, these are places I cannot get to. This is, this is terminal and you will die from this. The treatments he did offer were extreme 
and would only put off the inevitable. That is when that grim reaper, I could feel, I could feel that thing, that spirit of death and that spirit of fear walk in the room. And then I felt wonderful Jesus walk in the room as well. <laughs> and he said, but who do you say that I am? And it was in that moment that something rose up inside of me. And I remember answering him in my mind, this is going to be a great line in my book one day. In other words, I know you're going to heal me, and I'm going to write about this one day. Abigail declined the treatments and decided she would fight cancer taking a natural and dietary approach, and above all, praying and believing God for healing. As believers, there is a, a hope inside of us. And so, now, did, did I just walk around like, oh, you know, I didn't know how God was going to do it, but I knew my eyes were on Him. Enlisting the prayers of her family and friends, Abigail, a single mom of two, talked openly with her children about her health. And I remember my little girl, Lily, came up to me with a magazine, and she opened the magazine, and she loved American Girl dolls. They now have a an American Girl doll with no hair. And she said, Mom, maybe I need to get this one this year in case you lose your hair. And I said, Honey, you will not have to order that doll because Mommy is not losing her hair. Three months later, another PET scan showed that cancer was spreading aggressively in her lymph nodes. Holding on to hope was becoming harder. I simply had no options. I was just getting more scared and more frustrated and would wake up with dreams, seeing like a movie screen my funeral. Then, a couple months after getting that news, Abigail went to the Dominican Republic to visit a friend, a doctor, and take time to rest and see God. Abigail remembers showing her friend the PET scan results. The look on her face when she read that last one, and I had never seen her look like that. That did rattle me. All I know to do is seek God with all my heart. That's all I know to do. She would spend many hours that week in prayer, seeking God's will. Late one night, near the end of her visit, I got out there and I said, God, I need to know, am I going to die? What do you have to say about this? It was just me and God. That is when I felt Jesus walk in, if you will. And I felt his presence. He said, uh, Abigail, I came to have a conversation with you. I came to actually go on a walk. Abigail says she then saw a vision of herself with Jesus in Jerusalem. He walked her past the cross and into the tomb where he lay down. And he said, watch this. And he sat up and he said, Abigail, when I sat up, you sat up. And then he walked to the entrance of the tomb, and I will never forget this as long as I live. He said, when I walked out of the tomb, did I have cancer in my lungs? I said, no, Jesus, you didn't. He said, so do you have to have cancer in your lungs? I said, no, Jesus, I don't. And in that moment, I knew I am cancer free. A few weeks after she came home, Abigail faced yet another PET scan. She says that morning, Jesus spoke to her again. Good morning. This is the glory scan. <laughs> and I went, I went in that tube. You know, I hate those things. And I just sang, not a fear, not nothing. Later that day, a nurse called with the results. And she goes, Abigail, I, I don't really know what to say, but uh, there's nothing here. Like, there's, there's nothing here. And I was like, I know, I know. And I was like, <laughs> At the follow-up appointment, her oncologist confirmed that Abigail was cancer-free. He goes, I don't need my degree on my wall to see that this is a miracle. That was 2017, and Abigail has been cancer-free ever since. To anyone who's fighting a battle, her message is clear. Keep your eyes on Jesus. He was trying to tell me, this doesn't have to do with you. I took care of sin at the cross. I took care of every disease. I took care of every sickness. He is entirely the healer, entirely.
Yeah, hear that truth today. Jesus is the healer. He is your healer. And you may be watching Abigail's story and just wishing, hoping, I want that to be me. You see Abigail completely healed. She goes back to the doctor. The cancer that was terminal and aggressive is completely gone. And you want the same in your life. And I'm here to tell you that the same thing can happen to you. We just have to position our hearts to overcome the fear and the mountain of doubt that is in your heart, friend. I believe God wants us to move that mountain of fear and doubt. I believe he's gonna cast it into the sea right now. And I just pray in the name of Jesus that faith rises right now within you. Jesus is always the answer. He will forever be the only option and answer that we have. Sometimes when we get a diagnosis, you know, there's different options for treatment and there's nothing wrong with medicine and going that route. But we, in our faith, we have to come to a point where we say, Jesus, it's you and only you that I put my hope and my faith in. It is that heart posture, that mustard seed of faith that will move mountains on your behalf. It's nothing we do. It's only in the name of Jesus. So Andrew and I are gonna pray for you today. Whatever your needs are, bring that to the forefront of your mind as we enter the throne room of heaven. But before we do, we have some more amazing miracle testimonies of God doing miraculous things in the lives of those who love him. So this is from Judy on Facebook. And she said, I was told by multiple doctors to abort my baby. They said that she wouldn't make it due to medication I was taking when I didn't know I was pregnant. I had strong faith in Jesus Christ and knew the decision was not our own. Our church continued to pray for health over our baby for those eight and a half months. Our daughter was born completely healthy and is now pregnant with her own baby. Thank you, Lord. Amen. Here's one from Mary on Facebook. My right shoulder was healed. I went to a church service and a visiting minister held a prayer service. Next morning, the pain was gone. I got up and I vacuumed my bedroom with no problem. That's Amen. great news. Amen. Yes. Hey, let's pray for you. We just have a couple of minutes left, so let's bring our concerns to the Lord. Yeah. Father God, you know the hard cries of people, and we celebrate in these miracles we have seen. Lord God, however, there are still those in great need, and we bring their needs before you now. I just pray your Holy Spirit ministers through Ashley and I. Thank you, Jesus. Uh, somebody who has been uh, involved in the occult, witchcraft of some kind, some sort of darkness over you and your life and your household. And the Lord wants to invite you into relationship with his son, Jesus. And God wants to break the bondage to the occult. Mm. And that is good news. In Jesus' name, just say, Lord Jesus, I surrender to you. And he just wants to break those chains in Jesus' name. Yeah, I believe someone's watching. I don't know what kind of condition this is, but you're cold all the time, uh, whether it's from uh, certain medications that you're taking or it's a it's a autoimmune dis disease or something. I don't, whatever it is, it has no power over you any longer. Just say out loud, I am covered by the blood of Jesus. I am healed by the blood of Christ. Just receive your healing right now from whatever is causing that in Jesus' name. Thank you, Lord. Somebody has a hand that's been trembling for days and the Lord is healing you of that tremble. And someone else um, recently involved in some sort of spiritual failing and they feel they've disappointed the Lord because there's a love relationship there. This person knows Jesus and there's been a failing of some kind and the Holy Spirit just desires you to bring it to the cross, bring that failing, that disappointment to the cross where love is found. Jesus name. Amen and amen. Well, if you guys got an answer to prayer, please give us a call. 1-800-700-7000. And we leave you guys with words from Philippians 4:19, and my God will supply every need of yours according to his riches and glory in Christ Jesus. Amen and amen. You guys have a great day. We'll see you tomorrow. 
everyone, I'm Ashley Key. Thank you so much for watching this video. Be sure to like, subscribe, and hit the notification bell so we can reach more people with encouraging content like you just watched and so you never miss a beat. See you next time and God bless.